welcome to all our attendees. We have uh, over two and a half thousand people uh, registered for this event for, and with the help of the World Heart Federation, uh, you come from at least 25 different countries. So we've got a very uh, uh, eclectic audience today and we're going to talk about um, uh, a very important and interesting subject, which of course is probably what's drawn you to, to our session. I'm Gary Jennings from the Heart Foundation in Australia. And uh, as is um, normal here, we begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of country, in this case, throughout the world, and their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to, their, to them and their cultures and elders past, present and future. So uh, thank you very much partners. And uh, we have a number of uh, uh, sponsors who've helped um, uh, us um, make tonight uh, happen and uh, we're very grateful to them. But first I'm going to introduce you to um, our, uh, our speakers and our panelists. And uh, I'll begin with uh, actually who's coming last in our presentation, um, Pamela Waters, who's the director of the Sensheimer Cardiovascular Health Program in South Carolina from the United States. And like all our speakers tonight, a, a, an absolutely distinguished um, and, and extremely well-known um, uh, person in the, in the field. Uh, Gerald Watts is consultant physician uh, at uh, the Royal Perth Hospital, and he's presently chair of the Familial Hypercholesterolemia Australasia Network. David Sullivan from Royal Prince Alfred Hospital in, in Sydney is uh, once again a, an extremely well-known and well-published uh, lipidologist um, who's made a lot of contributions to guidelines and publications in, in the field. And uh, by no means least, Joanne mansky Nankervis, who's a, a, a general practitioner working in primary practice, but also at the University of Melbourne um, and on the past Parkville Precinct Medical. So we've got a wonderful group to talk about a really interesting subject with the emergence of things like new lipid biomarkers with new therapies, uh, uh, available uh, with guidelines that vary somewhat around the world. I think it's time for a, a really in-depth clinical discussion on uh, on screening and management of, of lipids. And uh, tonight we'll uh, you'll hear a little bit about uh, some new tests uh, for lipids and, and the old. We'll hear about their relationship to cardiovascular disease re risk. We'll touch on screening. Um, we'll touch on diagnosis of uh, of uh, familial hypercholesterolemia, which you'll hear is perhaps not as uncommon as you might have thought. And we'll hear from uh, our very uh, distinguished international guest speaker on lipid lowering therapies that are um, recently available and those that are on the horizon. So an exciting night and I'm look looking forward to it and I'm sure you are too. Uh, but uh, most important of all, we'll have some time at the end uh, for uh, questions from you. We've had lots of questions already, uh, but we look forward to more and a very interesting discussion. Those questions can be submitted through the Q&A box on your, your Zoom panel. Uh, we've got lots already, so um, and, and if we can't address them during the uh, uh, session, then we've got the opportunity for post-event communications. Um, you'll have um, uh, plenty of time to do that in the 20-minute uh, interactive section. But uh, let's go uh, with our presentations, uh, and we're having three eight-minute presentations, and the first is from Gerald Watts, and he's going to be talking on the screening and the diagnosis of familial hypercholesterolemia in primary care. Thank you very much, Professor Watts. Well, I'd like to thank the National Heart Foundation for this uh, opportunity to talk about, on, about FH. Now, all of you need to know uh, about this important topic because FH uh, is a preventable cause of premature heart disease and death, and it has significant uh, impact on public health. So what is FH uh, for those of you who not be, may be aware of it? Well, FH is a genetic condition which is present from birth. It is inherited in a dominant fashion. It leads to um, a reduction in functional LDL receptors uh, in the liver, uh, a marked elevation in LDL cholesterol, uh, and uh, as a consequence, ex an acceleration of atherosclerosis and uh, premature coronary heart disease. There are effectively two types of FH, heterozygous FH on the left, which is the one that we're talking about predominantly. There's one defective uh, gene, LDL cholesterol is above seven, 
and it uh, accelerates premature heart disease by 15 years. Homozygous effect by contrast are two defective genes, LDL cholesterol more than 15, and uh, it accelerates coronary heart disease by 30 years. Um, heterozygous FH is present in one in 250 in the population, meaning that there are about 100,000 people in Australia and 35 million worldwide. Now, this highlights the public health uh, problem uh, of FH, uh, especially considering that 90% of cases uh, remain uh, undetected. So why screen for FH? Well, here we are. It's a serious consequence from youth, from birth. Uh, it's, it's absent uh, physical signs in the young. Um, there are simple tests, the cholesterol and now genetic testing, good therapy, uh, uh, statins, azetimibe, PCSK9 inhibitor. It is cost effective and we all have a responsibility. Now, primary care GPs are very well placed to play an important role in screening uh, for FH uh, because, you know, they are the family doctors. What else do you want? 90% uh, uh, of patients, uh, people, sorry, in Australia actually see their GP um, every year. So there's a great opportunity here. So in primary care, uh, opportunistic testing uh, is the watchword with a non-fasting uh, uh, lipid profile in people with a family history of premature coronary disease and uh, um, hypercholesterolemia, uh, supplemented, uh, of course, with uh, laboratory alerts, uh, uh, heart health checks, great opportunity here, and systematic testing uh, for FH using uh, searching of electronic health records as published by my colleague, uh, uh, Tom Brett in Heart uh, quite recently. Coronary care aff affords a great opportunity and we need to work with primary care and identify and index cases. There are more recondite sources uh, or strategies for screening for FH, cascade testing, which we'll talk about shortly, and universal screening uh, of children with uh, reversed uh, child parent uh, cascade testing. So having uh, detected people at high risk uh, of having FH, uh, how do we make the diagnosis? Well, first, uh, phenotypically, it's actually relatively simple. Uh, uh, it uh, relies on a high LDL cholesterol uh, uh, in a fasting sample, a positive family history, a personal history of CAD, physical signs, and a so-called Dutch score in Australia of greater than five. So here we are, you know, this, uh, this can be generated numerically from, from the, um, uh, criteria shown on the right hand side and if the score is greater than five that's the magic number um, this is very important because that's the trigger uh, for you being able to um, refer a patient up or for a non-gp specialist uh, to um, proceed uh, with genetic testing which is now a medicare item uh, in australia so the question I'm often asked is, uh, well, why do a genetic test? You know, we've always uh, we've been managing uh, FH for years with, with cholesterol alone. Well, the, these, this is the rationale for genetic testing. It increases the precision of diagnosis. It improves CAD risk prediction in the community for every level of cholesterol. If you've got an, a pathogenic gene variant or mutation, your risk is much higher. It enables good therapeutic choices. It improves adherence to therapy and it facilitates uh, cascade testing. Just a small caveat, uh, as genetic testing is going to roll out into GP land and to not GP specialists, it is important uh, that these groups of health professionals be upskilled in uh, not only genetic testing, uh, but also uh, counselling. Let's look at this cascade testing. This is important, actually. Cascade testing is a highly cost-effective method of detecting new cases of FH among consenting blood relatives of index cases with FH. It may be carried out uh, using cholesterol or genetic testing, but genetic testing makes it uh, very much more cost-effective. Um, there is an MBS item now for index case testing uh, on the, uh, uh, in Australia to be carried out by non-GP specialists, but there's also an item for GPs to carry out genetic testing uh, among family members after the diagnosis uh, has been made uh, in an index case. So how does uh, cascade testing work? Uh, 
Well, following uh, the consent uh, of the index case shown in the black arrow there, or proban, testing is offered to first degree relatives who have a 50% chance of harboring FH, and then to second degree relatives who have a 25% chance of harboring FH. As you can see here, it's a very cost effective way of uh, identifying uh, new cases. So with a large pedigree, as you can see, of uh, um, many uh, uh, relatives, uh, the yield uh, may be over four uh, new cases detected. This is very cost effective. So such success uh, would certainly merit celebration uh, well, for Gary Jennings here with uh, a champagne fountain. Uh, and this is a good metaphor for the cascade testing principle. Now, it is important to note in closing uh, that what we've talked about here, screening and detection, diagnostic tools from the Dutch score and genetic testing, uh, needs to be incorporated into an integrated uh, model of care of FH as we've recently published uh, in our national guidelines. Um, uh, this model entails um, not only what we've talked about, but also risk stratification, which David will talk about in a different context than Pamela, uh, concerning targets and treatments. And of course, organization of services and implementation uh, is, uh, uh, the, um, is a great challenge. So uh, in conclusion, here my six take home message, FHS is a public health issue. This has been said by the Center of Disease Control. Early detection is essential. It's characterized by very high levels of LDL cholesterol, early CAD, and the treatments are good. Genetic defects are dominantly inherited with high penetrance in families. There are multiple screening methods that need to be coordinated. The diagnosis is actually quite simple. The genetic testing, now an MBS item, nails the diagnosis, but we all need upskilling on how to use it effectively. Coordination of care and implementation remains a huge channel challenge for us, and we all have the responsibility to make this work. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Gerald. I'm sure that was fascinating. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions related to, to that when we come to that section. Um, our next presentation is from David Sullivan, and he's going to um, give us an introduction to the wide range of, um, of various lipid biomarkers that are available and their relationship to cardiovascular risk. Thank you, David. Thanks, Gary, and I would like to thank the uh, National Heart Foundation for the opportunity to address this issue tonight. I'm just trying to start share, uh, screen sharing, but I think I need to um, uh, escape from the previous presentation first. Gerald, would you mind stop sharing? Thank you, and I'm really grateful for the opportunity to cover this topic tonight. Um, and I hope I'll challenge some of your concepts. Uh, and, uh, and introduce you to guidelines more about laboratory testing than about the traditional things that we hear about in terms of management. Uh, and if I am challenging your concepts, maybe we can pick this up in uh, subsequent communication. So there's been a lot of work, particularly out of Europe about uh, advice about lipid testing. And it's been captured here in Australia with some guidelines on harmonized reporting. And there have been about five major recommendations. The two I'd like to highlight are the routine reporting of non-HDL cholesterol, which I'll uh, cover in detail, and also the wider use of non-fasting specimens, which infers a need to understand the role of triglyceride. Uh, these are the two main topics I'll concentrate on, but the guidelines also uh, for uh, Gerald's uh, interest uh, highlight uh, lipid results above which uh, a risk of familial hypercholesterolemia is flagged. It makes the appropriate links to uh, National Heart Foundation targets for lipid lowering. And there is also routine reporting of the total to HDL cholesterol ratio, but that's purely to avoid transcription errors. errors. At a laboratory level, we are rather dis uh, dismissive of the use of ratios in anything but the absolute risk scenario. So why should we concentrate on non-HDL cholesterol? It is because it's better than LDL cholesterol in terms of assessing cardiovascular risk. And we have some inertia here. I think our evidence is very much in terms of LDL cholesterol. And the main objective tonight is to get you to go away and think about using non-HDL cholesterol 
because it's easier and it's better. It outperforms LDL cholesterol as a marker of cardiovascular disease, as in a number of studies, for instance, the US physician study. Um, and in terms of that replacement, you could largely replace your LDL uh, target levels with non-HDL cholesterol target levels, which are about 0.8 of a millimole per liter higher. That would be about 30 milligrams per deciliter higher. And you can justify this because um, it is largely reflecting the cholesterol component of additional atherogenic particles, particularly RDL cholesterol and VLDL remnants. Um, and this is not incorporated into LDL cholesterol. So it's a more sensitive uh, test in that regard. Uh, it's also easier because it's relatively unaffected by food and can therefore be performed in a fasting state. So in allowing the use of non-fasting samples, we do have to understand that the intake of food predominantly affects triglyceride. And if we're allowing this, if we try to capture the risk associated with triglyceride, we actually find that evidence from the Copenhagen Heart Study suggests that a non-fasting sample is more sensitive because it's stressing the system, is drawing out those particular patients who uh, may not have a problem evident in the fasting state, but do when challenged with a meal. Fasting is only required really for the formal diagnosis of hypertriglyceridemia or the calculation of LDL cholesterol. And in these situations, a 12 hour fast is required. And we hope that this will feed through and greatly facilitate clinical management. I think it's just a much uh, preferable scenario to be able to offer a patient uh, the opportunity to have uh, the sample collected without the associated necessity to fast. And this may make the testing more frequent, more convenient uh, and more timely. In this process, I think we also have to have a clearer understanding of why triglyceride is probably an independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease. It's been clouded by its inverse relationship between it with HDL cholesterol. And it's now clear that the, um, the relationship with cardiovascular disease is driven much more by the triglyceride component. Let's try and explain this at the level of the artery wall. And the first point is that triglyceride is probably not a linear risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Uh, it's a heterogeneous situation depending on the size, number and composition of the particles. In massive hypertriglyceridemia, the particles are probably not so numerous, but are huge and less likely to carry cholesterol into the artery wall. The greater risk is probably with mild to moderately elevated uh, uh, triglyceride in which the particles can penetrate and do damage. But simultaneously, the presence of triglyceride upregulates cholesterol ester transfer protein, allowing lipids to flow down their concentration gradients. In doing so, we lose cholesterol from HDL replaced by triglyceride, which is used as fuel. The HDL becomes unstable and is lost. And to any degree to which reverse cholesterol transport is protective, that process is lessened. A little less, a little counterintuitively, the same sort of process that happens with LDL to the detriment of the artery wall. Same exchange, same loss of cholesterol, replacement with triglyceride, uh, removal and the establishment of small dense LDL cholesterol uh, particles, which are more readily able to penetrate the artery wall, more oxi oxidizable, more atherogenic, more likely to do damage. And the damage is on a per particle basis rather than the actual amount of cholesterol carried. Therefore, when triglyceride is elevated, LDL cholesterol underestimates particle number and cardiovascular risk, and that risk is therefore better reflected by non-HDL cholesterol. And this addresses the issue of uh, LDL subfractions and so forth. A lot of excitement about small dense LDL, et cetera, et cetera. But the main issue is the number of particles. You can see here that in the Quebec Heart Study, uh, in the presence of low numbers of LDL, it didn't matter whether they're large or small, the risk's the same, it's not elevated. It's certainly not excuse for uh, ignoring any elevation of cholesterol, that's always an increase in risk. If the particles are normal, it's a certain level of risk. But if in addition, the particles are small and dense, we're still underestimating their number, we're still underestimating the risk, the risk is actually far greater than we might have appreciated. We can 
more accurately quantify that risk by measuring APOB, where there's one molecule per particle. However, non-HDL cholesterol suffices as the poor man's APOB. It's more available, it's cheaper, etc. If we want to get fancy about it, yes, there are research techniques with NMR spectroscopy measuring particle number, uh, but that's not really uh, necessary. So uh, LDL size and density is not an excuse to ignore hypercholesterolemia, rather it's a way to compensate for the reduced LDL cholesterol, which applies when triglyceride levels are high. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go too much into the business of trying to finesse cardiovascular risk, particularly in the intermediate risk ranges. However, some of the potential biomarkers are lipid in nature. The one to keep an eye on is lipoprotein little a, which does a very good job of differentiating the level of intermediate risk uh, when levels are low or high. Uh, other risk factors also allow this reclassification where it's not necessary for them to be um, treatable or independent because in any uh, exercise where we're defining higher risk, such as in uh, renal impairment, uh, that is identifying a group of patients who warrant uh, more, uh, more vigorous intervention. And the similar comments probably about the vexed issue of uh, non-invasive imaging. I think it provides the opportunity to finesse the uh, extremes of primary and secondary prevention, which are sort of almost opposite in terms of their implication for treatment. Primary prevention, we face a risk of overtreatment. Secondary prevention, we want to treat any risk factor because it's already had consequences. Um, and if we can refine the, the presence or absence of subclinical cardiovascular disease by non-invasive means, uh, that's a, a further refinement of risk assessment. Uh, we have to work out how we introduce that into screening algorithms. So in summary, um, I'd like to highlight that harmonized lip, uh, lipid reporting is emphasizing the benefits of non-HDL cholesterol which is a better predictor than LDL cholesterol. It can be performed non-fasting and it uh, behoves us to uh, understand the reciprocal relationship between triglyceride and HDL and the effect on other uh, uh, atherogenic particles. Triglyceride modifies those particles such that the risk is proportional to the number of, number of particles present. There are some other lipid and other biomarkers that will allow us to finesse risk assessment, particularly in intermediate risk, lipoprotein little a uh, uh, primary amongst them. Uh, and uh, also some non-invasive techniques may allow further finessing of the distinction between primary and secondary prevention. And uh, I hope after that brief um, uh, summary that you'll be aware of the polling, be beware of the polling question and come in with some alternative answers for that. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. That was terrific. We're going to move on now to some uh, practical aspects of uh, particularly the new lipid lowering therapies in preventing and treating cardiovascular disease. And I'm looking forward very much to hearing what uh, Dr. Morris has to say about that. Thank you very much. Well, thank you all so much. And I'd really like to thank you for the invitation to be here with you this evening. It is great to have an opportunity to share some knowledge and questions with my colleagues from around the globe. So I want to talk a little bit about guidelines. There's really a tremendous delay in implementation of evidence-based guidelines. And I feel like some of that, um, the delay in the clinical inertia is really related to a misunderstanding of uh, modest differences between uh, international uh, guidelines. And so just take a moment to um, review some of this and see if I can, there we go. Those are my disclosures. So first of all, the US guidelines and the European guidelines were published within nine months of each other to really reflect some of the newer evidence that had been published uh, in the interim between previous iterations of the guidelines. It's really important to understand that both of them emphasize, and I apologize to Dr. Sullivan, LDL cholesterol um, as the primary target of therapy with non-HDL as a secondary target, and we're a little behind the times, but they do both agree that lower is better. 
Now, both guidelines recommend the importance of assessment of cardiovascular risk in both primary and secondary prevention. And the reason for that really is to uh, target those patients who are most likely to benefit from therapy. Here we see from the cholesterol treatment trialist collaboration that the greatest number of adverse cardiovascular events and the lower number needed to treat are among patients with the highest baseline level of risk. So we match the intensity of our therapy to the patient's level of risk, therefore achieving the greatest uh, benefit. Now, in terms of risk, we know that using in primary prevention, using whether it is the US uh, ASDVD risk calculator for those in the US or using score algorithms or some countries with multi-ethnic populations use the Framingham uh, criteria. Regardless, we know that the calculators are just a starting point. And both the US and the European guidelines have what we call risk enhancers or risk modifiers. These are factors that are not included in the risk calculator, but can help us to identify those patients who may be at greater risk than the calculators more may portray. So in the US that may include things like the metabolic syndrome, chronic kidney disease, elevated lipoprotein little a, elevated triglycerides and a strong family history or inflammatory disease. And this is particularly helpful in individuals at borderline or intermediate risk. Now, similarly, the European guidelines have what they call risk modifiers to the score estimate. And that might uh, include some things like social determinants of health, like social depri deprivation uh, or other uh, factors such as psychosocial stress or psychiatric disorders. European guidelines also include things like atrial fibri fibrillation and left ventricular hypertrophy. Now, um, both guidelines also include marker, markers of subclinical atherosclerosis. Uh, in the US, we use coronary artery calcium scoring, and if calcium, uh, any evidence of clinical disease is present, then uh, there is a recommendation for implementation of statin therapy. In the European guidelines, they extend markers of subclinical atherosclerosis beyond calcium scoring to evidence of subclinical non-obstructive coronary disease on cardiac CT, evidence of uh, carotid plaque, or also uh, both include uh, a reduced ankle brachial index as a marker of increased risk and subclinical disease. When we look at therapeutic recommendations between the two guidelines, uh, they, the US guidelines focus on the intensity of statin therapy. Um, both look at percent reduction in LDL cholesterol. The US guidelines also include uh, L absolute LDL cholesterol thresholds and the European guidelines recommend absolute LDL cholesterol goals. Now, when it comes to therapies, remarkable similarity between the two guidelines, we get to the exact same place in treatment recommendations, even though we get there a little bit differently in terms of LDL cholesterol, uh, whether it's goals, thresholds, or percent reduction. The US guidelines recommend azetamide, prior to the initiation of a PCSK9 inhibitor in very high risk patients. And similarly, the European guidelines, again, recommend azetamide in high risk, very high risk patients prior to the initiation of a PCSK9 inhibitor. Now, in the last few moments of my presentation, I wanted to just familiarize you with three important treatments uh, in the field of lipid lowering therapy. The first is bempedoic acid, which is FDA approved in the United States for patients with clinical ASCVD or a familial hypercholesterolemia who are unable to achieve adequate lowering of uh, LDL 
on maximally tolerated statin with or without azetamide. This uh, drug is an ATP citrate lyase inhibitor um, that upregulates the LDL receptor. It is upstream of HMG-CoA reductase in the cholesterol synthesis pathway. It is administered as a prodrug. And this is very interesting because the activator ACSVL1 is only present in, in liver. It is not present in muscle. Therefore, it is felt to have better tolerability in patients with statin-associated muscle symptoms. It results in an approximate 20 or so percent, 17% uh, or so, uh, up to 20% reduction in LDL cholesterol when combined with azetamide. It's about a 36% reduction in LDL, about one and a half millimoles. And this is very important for patients with statin associated side effects. Uh, we can turn to bempedoic acid uh, in combination with azetamide for these patients. Also important to think beyond the PCSK9 monoclonal antibodies uh, with the role of small uh, interfering RNA. Uh, this is in glycerin. Uh, in glycerin is a, an siRNA that reduces the synthesis of the of PCSK9 protein and can significantly uh, lower LDL cholesterol. Here we see the reductions. This is in hypercholesterolemia. On the left, we see about a 60% reduction in uh, LDL cholesterol from both the Orion 10 and the Orion 11 trials. Uh, the absolute change here you can see on the right in milligrams per deciliter, uh, here uh, greater than about uh, 50 milligrams per deciliter there. Another drug that's very important to be familiar with is evanacumab. This is an ANG-PTL3 uh, inhibitor. Um, remember, ANG-PTL3 is an inhibitor itself of lipoprotein lipase and endothelial lipase and plays a role in lipid metabolism. Loss of function variants of ANG-PTL3 have been associated with lower levels of LDL cholesterol and triglycerides. So evanacumab is a fully human monoclonal antibody of ANG-PTL3 that reduces LDL cholesterol independently of the LDL receptor and can reduce uh, uh, LDL cholesterol by about um, 45 to 50%. It is also effective in patients with homozygous FH, regardless of whether or not there is uh, an LDL and functional LDL cholesterol, uh, LDL uh, receptor present. So very important for patients with FH because it's independent of the LDL receptor. So with that, I just wanted to summarize to that uh, the guideline comparisons, the guidelines are based on very similar concepts and principles with broad agreements in terms of the key issues. We do need additional guidance. Neither of the guidelines incorporate bempedoic acid or evanacumab. And then of course, in the US, we are awaiting for uh, approval of uh, inclycerin. So thank you so much uh, for your attention and I greatly look forward to the question and answer session. Thank you. You're on mute, Dr. Sullivan. We're going to move, thank you very much. That was wonderful. Uh, we're going to move on now and get the audience to do a little bit of work. And we've got a polling question, which uh, David Sullivan has uh, told us to be aware of. Um, and uh, the reason, of course, is uh, it's a bit of a test of whether we've been listening or not to him. And uh, for those that have, just add 0.8 to B, C and D uh, for your own thresholds for non-HDL cholesterol. But uh, this is the question, what, uh, what target do you aim for when treating people at, uh, at high risk? Do you have no target? you have specific numbers you try and reach? Uh, do you just try and get them on the highest dose of statin that you can, that you can, uh, you can manage? And uh, please um, uh, choose one of those and we'll see what the audience thinks about uh, targets for lipid lowering therapies.
these results will come through in about 20 seconds. Okay. Any comments on that, Gerald? Uh, very interesting, actually. That's the first thing. Um, clearly, it's interesting that uh, people do have targets and it really does reflect uh, uh, clinical practice. You do need targets uh, to initiate uh, what well, these thresholds or triggers uh, to guide therapy. Um, I'd say even uh, in high risk primary prevention, uh, I would agree. Uh, I actually did vote to an LDL cholesterol less than 1.8 millimoles per litre. Uh, that would be my uh, my target. Uh, I know there are others, uh, but certainly for FH, uh, we certainly aim for less than 1.8, uh, particularly if there is uh, uh, evidence of subclinical atherosclerosis. And of course, you know, that uh, will come up in later conversation. Are you happy with that, Pamela? I am happy with that. I, I would agree. There may be the, the one category for which I might be target slightly lower, more to 1.4. There are the very high risk uh, patients who also have evidence of primary prevention, but evidence of subclinical disease. And I have to be honest, if someone has an abnormal calcium score, I may drive that LDL just a little bit lower uh, in, that, in those instances. We might come back to calcium scores a little bit a little bit later, but uh, in the meantime, I'd love to hear from Joanne about what all this means for primary care. How do we tr translate all this new and emerging data in 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 the daily hurly burly of uh, of clinical practice? Do you see some quick wins here? And yeah, I think the the first quick win is just to even have this on the radar. And um, personally, I think just even going back and finding what your favourite resource is going to be, whether that be uh, for people in Australia, the familial hypercholesterolemia Australasia website has heaps of good information on it. Local health pathways that also provide um, guidance in terms of if you do need to refer to a specialist lipid clinic, who is that going to be in your area? Because it'll be different medical specialties depending on where people are. Uh, therapeutic guidelines and things like NPS's um, SAMS flowchart for the people that are getting that muscle um, pain to work out how to deal with that and get people to be able to stay on statins if they can tolerate it. I think the really key thing here for me is we have so many different guidelines in Australia that have so many different cholesterol targets. So it's not a surprise to me at all that we had such a really interesting um, spread um, across the different groups. So I think going back and um, to our practices and having a practice champion for that cardiovascular disease risk reduction is going to be really important in translating all this um, new and emerging evidence that hasn't necessarily met or um, made its way into all of our different um, guidelines at the moment is really important for us to provide that proactive rather than more reactive care. Thank you. And just on that, uh, we are in the process of revising the Australian guideline on absolute risk and uh, there will no doubt, well, we know that there will be a new algorithm which will come in with some slightly different variables to those we have now. Uh, but I think um, uh, the European and US guidelines that Pamela's described are more recent than ours and give you a good guide as to where things might, uh, might head. Um, so where does this cardiovascular disease prevention and screening fit into general practice amongst all the competing priorities that you've got, uh, particularly in a COVID world. Um, Joanne? Yeah, well, I was just going to say that, you know, um, I take my hat off to all the GPs and general practice nurses that are on the call tonight because um, it's tough being a generalist. You know, they have to have a good knowledge of around 167 conditions just to manage 85% of our um, presentations and cardiovascular disease and, high, and familial hypercholesterolemia is just, you know, one of those. So, um, and there have been a lot of challenges and it's a really, really busy time. And I guess one kind of approach is I know that we've got World Heart Day coming up on the 29th of September. And I really think it's an opportunity for us to, to consider... Um, that is maybe a heart health month or, or something similar like that in the practice. Um, there's heaps of waiting room resources, resources that you can share during um, telehealth to really make an effort to um, assess cardiovascular disease risk, to proactively identify people using clinical audit tools or algorithms in your electronic medical records 
then we can try to bring back and do our health assessments and our general practice management plans to, to really start addressing this really significant problem and actively bringing people back to get their cardiovascular disease risk assessed. When we know that um, because of COVID, people have maybe stayed away from general practice a little bit more um, and we've all been very busy doing other things like COVID vaccinations and the like, but this is a really great opportunity for us to to um, continue engaging and perhaps for some people re-engaging them to have that increased focus on their heart health. That's great. We've got three uh, quick questions, Gerald, on FH. Um, firstly, do how far do we go with the, with the relatives? Do we offer genetic testing to first, second and third degree blood relatives? Um, what age, I'll, I'll, get, I'll get all three out if that's all right so that you can deal with them at once. What age should you start FH screening? And thirdly, uh, are PSK9 inhibitors available to GPs to describe it once they've made a genetic diagnosis of FH and, and, and that the patient's refractory to statins? Okay, so I mean, firstly, you know, it's all uh, informed consent, uh, offering tests, um, the cascade testing, clearly it's more cost effective to start with uh, first degree relatives because they have a 50% chance then progress on to second and third degree relatives. But it's usually first and second because there you'll find uh, a, new, a new case and that will set off another cascade, very much like the champagne fountain. You know, that's where you get the returns. I think going off and doing third, fourth degree relatives, you know, resources are limited. Um, and this is the sort of thing we need to work uh, uh, Joanne, not only with uh, GP, but with non-GP specialists, there's a lot of upskilling, you know. Um, it, who do you refer these people to? Where, where will it be done? Uh, as you well know, you can refer it to a local specialist department and be seen by a registrar who probably knows less than you. So everyone needs to be upskilled. But for cascade testing, yes, one, two and three, you know, if they consent. If the index case doesn't consent to anything, I think you're stuffed for the moment, really, you know, unless there's a specific duty of care, and certainly with children, really, child protection may be brought in, really, if some of the parents are being difficult, and we've actually done that, really, particularly with the first family with the PCSK9 gain of function mutation that the children were now treated and on PCSK9 inhibitors. Um, um, the detection of children, there was a question on when to do all this. I think if you're suspecting homozygous FH, well, as soon as possible, the age of one or two. If you're suspecting heterozygous FH, it's slightly different really, the age of five or eight, depending on the family history and the consent uh, from uh, the parents. Uh, and, you know, initially children uh, are not, uh, um, are not cases, uh, are not people to be genetically tested ab initio. They traditionally have been tested in the setting of a um, gene variant having been identified in the parent. But that may well change with universal screening of children uh, at the age of two and reverse parent, uh, child parent cascade testing, where I think, you know, where the money is. In terms of PCSK9 inhibitors in general practice, um, at the moment, really, uh, if you have a genetic test, the trigger is still for the uh, non-GP specialist to start the ball rolling and then it's uh, a coding system. But I mean, you know, that has to change and will change. Um, so the very important questions covering aspects of screening uh, and therapy. So thanks very much. Thank you, Gerald. Look, um, as always in these, there's a lot of interest in calcium scores and I'd be interested, Pamela, in where you see it fitting into this discussion. And I think there's a, a slightly nuanced, one of the questions here is slightly nuanced about what, uh, what it means when you're treating people for, for hyperlipidemia. But oh, that's a, great, that's a great question as well. So, you know, it's very interesting. Calcium scoring has been around now for more than 30 years. It, uh, I was first working with this back in, 1990 when some of the earliest work has been around and it's really been slow to um, come to the forefront not due to lack of data but really due to the fact that originally it was not reimbursed by insurance in many countries but the data is quite solid that it is uh, an incredibly important predictor of risk and it's also the presence of coronary calcium is, is pathognomonic for the presence of atherosclerosis. So if a patient is trying to figure out whether or not their lipid disorder is really uh, predictive of risk in them, 
the presence of any disease answers that question absolutely. Um, disease is present. And atherosclerosis is a progressive disease. So unless we intervene um, to change what the risk factors that uh, brought it uh, to be to begin with, um, the disease will progress. So um, in the US, you know, it's mostly self-pay. It, it's, it's usually in the range of about 99 to 150 US dollars. And we use it quite commonly to help us particularly in borderline or intermediate risk cases where the decision regarding statin therapy is uncertain. We don't need it in very high risk patients. We don't necessarily need it in very low risk patients, but it can be very beneficial for patients um, for whom the risk prediction is uncertain or for patients um, who are reluctant to initiate statin therapy. Now, the question that the viewer or participant asked about um, once you are on statin therapy. This, it's really not useful in monitoring disease. Once you've made the decision to initiate statin therapy, the test becomes less helpful. And that is because uh, initiating statin therapy, there can be some progression of coronary calcification. The plaque becomes modified. There is less of a lipid rich and an inflammatory component and more what I call healing of the calcific component. So it can be misleading. The calcium score goes up, but the risk does not necessarily go up when you are on statin therapy. So I don't routinely do serial um, calcium scoring in patients who are on statin therapy. Thank you. And, and that's very consistent with our own uh, position paper here. Um, David, um, we have a question about whether there's any reason or benefit in performing lipid subfractions in primary care. Thanks, Gary. Uh, I think the main emphasis needs to be on the number of atherogenic particles. And I think sometimes it's not fully realised that the subfraction tests, things like looking at um, LDL size and density, small dense LDL patterns, A and B, et cetera, et cetera, they're telling you the diameter of the, of the particle, but they're not telling you the number of the particle. Uh, I think they are often used in a situation where it's, people are searching for an excuse not to treat hypercholesterolemia. And I think that's uh, an invalid uh, interpretation of any, any uh, subfraction information. The primary purpose of any of the subfraction analyses is to uh, is to reveal increased risk where people looking at the LDL cholesterol may not realize that uh, there is an increased number of particles present. Um, I, I think it is only relevant when triglyceride is elevated. Um, I think it's probably well substituted by tests like um, APOB or even, uh, as I said, poor person's non-HDL cholesterol. Uh, if people want to do um, sort of gold standard sorts of things, then I guess uh, I would pursue the NMR particle, LDL particle counts, which uh, aren't readily available in Australia um, and are largely of research interest. So I think greater, more to have a confidence with addressing triglyceride HDL issues rather than doing LDL subfractions. And uh, our panelists agree with that? Yes, uh, lots of nods. I've got two um, questions which I'll, I'll bring together because they're somewhat related. One is about um, uh, clarification on the long-term side effects of statin in the, with a particular uh, reference to diabetes and dementia. And the other is uh, about uh, deprescribing statins. Is, there, is that something that uh, should ever be considered? And, uh, and uh, if so, what are the consequences? Know who would like to answer that? Pamela? Sure, I, um, I'll start with the, the second question about deprescribing and maybe give the other questions to, to my panelists. But, you know, there are instances where I will deprescribe in older adults who have other comorbidities that are likely to impact their quality or duration of life. 
However, there still is some data that demonstrates for us that even in older adults, discontinuation of statin therapy can result in an increase in cardiovascular events. So I think it really has to be taken, that decision has to be made in the context of shared decision-making and looking at the patient's other comorbidities and competing um, morbidities. Thank you. Uh, Joanne, you're dealing with polypharmacy all the time. How, how do you deal with, uh, with that and, and uh, decisions about be prescribing in older people? Um, I think that it's very hard just to make a, a generalisation based on a person's age because we can have some people that have, you know, um, fantastic at an older age and some people at a younger age that are um, really uh, have significant health issues. So I think it really is um, about taking individualised decision-making approach and looking at the risks and benefits, um, looking at multimorbidity, looking at life expectancy, and then making that, that decision based on, on all of those uh, different factors. There will be um, people that obviously can have challenges tolerating statins, um, but a lot of the time we can either seize them for a while or um, uh, and restart or try them every second day or, or try and play around with the, the dosage. So I think there's a lots of different ways that we can um, you know, approach this issue. And I guess the other thing that can often be uh, helpful, particularly if people have uh, significant multimorbidity, is getting a pharmacist involved in helping to do a home medication review or something similar. Um, and that can help reveal what the priorities are um, and help to, to make sure that the medications that people are on are the ones that are going to benefit them the most. Thank you. Well, we've got the inevitable question. Uh, David, you've convinced us that triglycerides matter or can matter. Um, so what about fish, fish oil, fish and chips? Um, what's your advice on use of um, particularly fish oils and chips? Thanks, Gary. The evidence is pretty difficult to interpret here. I think we've had clear evidence of benefit and the evidence for the benefits of eating fish have been sustained. I don't think there's any question about that, whether it's for substitution of other uh, alternative uh, sources of protein, could, we could debate. However, the question of supplementation with fish oil products is more vexed. Uh, it was very encouraging, probably up to around about 2010. And since that time, we've had negative trials in all but one instance. Um, rather than try to explain those outcomes, I think it's important to say that, first of all, there are some important community misperceptions. Fish oil supplements are never going to benefit your LDL cholesterol level. People, I think, use them as a substitute for effective therapies, and that's not an appropriate uh, application. They may have some modest benefit in terms of uh, non-HDL cholesterol, but I think if they are effective, it's through alternative mechanisms. Uh, and I think now the evidence is probably accumulating that the supplementation, that evidence is probably fairly marginal. Uh, I think they're effective triglyceride lowering agents and can be used in that, in that sort of setting. But uh, the, the overall impact is probably only commensurate with the degree of non-HDL cholesterol reduction. Uh, so I would just encourage us not to think of them as alternative LDL cholesterol lowering treatments. How about in the, US, in the US, Pamela, to what extent are you using? So, you know, in the American College of Cardiology just published yesterday a, uh, a, some guidance, clinical guidance on a comprehensive approach to patients with hypertriglyceridemia, um, really emphasizing the critical importance of secondary factors such as poorly controlled diabetes, uh, medications that can exacerbate, and the, the importance of lifestyle intervention they did make some conservative recommendations for um, very high risk patients with ASCVD or um, diabetes with additional risk factors with a, uh, a modest recommendations for consideration of icosapent ethyl in uh, carefully selected patients as well. We do not recommend dietary supplement omega-3 fatty acids for any patients. 
thank you. Uh, while we're on diet and exercise, um, uh, do you have any thoughts on, on um, how to best uh, get the most out of them, uh, particularly when you're trying to lower cholesterol levels in, in primary care, Joanne? Yeah, thanks. I think obviously it's really important. We've, we've talked a lot about the medications, which are really critical, but obviously the, the lifestyle modification is really, really important as well. Um, I think particularly for the exercise, um, obviously there's recommendations for aerobic exercise and some benefits around um, resistance-based exercise as well. And if people are looking for some really great resources, then um, the exercise physiologists so the exercise and sports science Australia and the exercise is medicine um, movement have some really good resources to, to give some of those indications about the most appropriate exercises, uh, both to help manage cholesterol, but also again, a lot of the other conditions that often cluster um, around with these conditions like diabetes and um, uh, heart disease as well. So they've got fantastic resources to use. Um, Diet's a really tricky one because obviously it's so controversial, isn't it? And there's been obviously advice around reduction um, in saturated fats and uh, lots of controversy about other diets like low-carb diets and things like that. But I think the, the key thing here is um, developing an approach that is going to be sustainable um, and safe, uh, taking into account, again, different comorbidities that people can have as well. Well, I think you've opened Pandora's box with the, with the discussion on diet, and that might be cause for another webinar at another time because we could talk at, at some length about that. Uh, I think we might um, uh, begin to uh, bring the meeting to a close because time is running out. Uh, please, for those of you uh, who are interested in following up on this, have a look at the Heart Foundation's new Heart Health Check Toolkit. It's on the website and it's a one-stop shop that's designed to really assist you in primary care to assess and manage cardiovascular risk uh, following the latest guidance. Lots of tools and resources and assessment and management uh, templates and they're available in some of your clinical software too. So just keep an eye out in that space. Um, I think we've had a terrific discussion from a terrific panel and uh, certainly I've enjoyed it uh, very much and I hope you have too. Um, we're excited, as we've said, to be leading the development of the new absolute cardiovascular risk guidelines and the kind of discussion and evidence we've talked about uh, tonight will really uh, inform that. So uh, keep, watch that space too for more guidelines, education and, and quality improvement uh, activities. Thank you all attendees. Uh, special thanks to our, uh, to our panelists. Um, a recording will be sent to you in the next few weeks and please, please, please do the evaluation survey, um, which will automatically pop up when this webinar um, ends and uh, uh, to, the, to everyone uh, uh, have, a, have a wonderful evening, morning, day, whatever time it is, wherever you are. And, uh, and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.